Today on Show and Tell, we've got a horn that's as old as the company that's responsible for most of my wardrobe, and not for nothing, but it's the model that inspired the one and only Con 8D. I think we're in for a treat today. Hey there everybody, it's your host Sam here from the Samuel Plays Brass channel. Thanks so much for tuning in and I hope you're doing well. This is a very special instrument indeed, belonging to the one and only Vern Windham, Spokane, Washington's very own horn player and music director extraordinaire and radio star. So this is very exciting. Let's all say hello to the 1969 Ed Crusby double French horn. Most serious hornists will be familiar with what we call a crusty wrap. It's a specific style in which the French horn is designed with valves 1, 2, 3, and 4 being tucked to the left and up of the first valve. It's a fairly common style. You see it on Con 8Ds, as I mentioned, and Holton 179s. Those are two of the best-selling professional French horns out there. The Con 6D I had before, and even the Holton 378 I was borrowing before that. Both were crusty wraps, so it's a Style that was very popular throughout the latter half of the 20th century in America, though it's sort of being phased out now. But in any case, what a lot of people don't know is that Crusby is as much a brand name as it is the name of the French horn rap. Ed Crusby is the name of the manufacturer who made these brilliant old horns. And in fact, as far as I know, the Crusby line is actually still in production today, which is pretty nuts. This model was all the rage back in 1969 when a starry-eyed young Vern Wyndham decided he wanted one, and he got one. This horn was at one point lacquered, but it's obviously shed the great majority of its skin. There are only very small vestiges of lacquer we can see left on it. And it's mostly yellow brass with some nickel silver highlights on these slide tubes here, valve casings, some of the ferrules, and the mouthpiece receiver. This is a true Euroshank mouthpiece receiver. If you find a mouthpiece that is a standard US fit, it's only gonna go about that far into the shank, which is definitely not ideal. And for reference, my Con 8D is sort of an intermediary in between the Euroshank and the US large Morse taper. Uh, it's closer to the Euroshank, if anything, but still just a little bit larger. This is the smallest shank I've seen. Mouthpieces barely seem to go into it if you don't find the right one. The bell engraving says Ed Crusby, Erfurt with what looks like a large bird holding a horn. And in general, considering this is the horn that inspired the Con 8D, unsurprisingly, we see a lot of similarities besides this slide looking rather wide and angular and uh, some differences in the way the tubing is wrapped around this trigger, although we'll get to more of that. And a small note to make is that the B-flat first valve slide is more rounded off than it would be on the Con 8D, which just has a quick 180 degree bend with a couple of pull nubs on it. In character of a true European double horn, this thumb trigger can be reconfigured from native F to B flat to instead natively B flat and press for F, which is actually how I've got it set up right now. I thought it'd be a fun challenge to kind of turn the horn upside down and have to relearn it. And I found that it gives the horn sort of a different character when you're natively in B flat and you only use the F trigger for certain notes. More on that whole process later. We've also got this adjustable paddle here, where this paddle rests is on the skin right next to your forefinger, which I think is a really cool feature. I wish we saw that on more modern horns because the way most doubles are set up is a lot of weight has to rest on your pinky finger. It's not very desirable at all. My pinky's not very strong. I don't know about yours, but you'd basically just adjust this paddle to your liking and allow the weight to float right there on your left hand, which is a lot better in my opinion. And it's almost like having an adjustable thumb trigger because of the way your hand is forced to sort of slide along this tube here as you adjust it. And while we're looking at the back of the horn, I should mention a couple of aftermarket features that Vern had done to it. First of all, the valves had a total valve job, you know, replated and relapped and everything. I think a couple decades ago, but to be honest, this horn's got so many miles on it, Vern was playing it so much that it might need another <laughs> at some point. This lead pipe here is a Lawson. It says on it, FB110.25, not the faintest clue what that means. Uh, and we've also got an Amato water key here, currently seized in place, unfortunate. We've also had some custom patching work done here. So this horn's been through the mill a couple times, but you know, we've still got a really cool piece of history. In case the reversible thumb trigger enthralls you as much as it does me, we're gonna spend some more time talking about that. If we exclude this screw in the middle here, which we don't really care about for the purposes of this discussion, we have two screws, a larger one up here and a smaller one down here. And these two screws can be altered in their positions to be like this instead, and this will switch the positions of the trigger. Now, you always want them 180 degrees apart. You don't want them 90 on either side. So always 180, just swap them around. 
and you've reversed your trigger uh, in one way or another. Right now it's again set up to play in B flat F rather than F B flat. The whole process is very quick. You just find the B on one large screw post or the F on the other large screw post. And then you basically just take the large screw out, move it to the corresponding post that you'd like it to natively be in. And then you move the small screw along with this linkage arm here over to the other slot for it. And the whole process is very, very quick and brain deadedly simple. It takes 60 to 90 seconds and only gets faster with practice. Looking closer at it, it may be the case that the B and F that I mentioned were etched on those large screw posts. It may have been an aftermarket thing. Uh, it definitely makes the process simpler for the user. But even if you didn't have those, all you would really have to do is find a particular configuration of your choosing, play the harmonic series without the trigger engaged, and then with the trigger engaged. And if you find the harmonic series moves up, you're in the American convention of F, B flat. And if the harmonic series moves down, you're in the convention of B flat F, the more European way of doing things, or you just do it with a tuner. This is the point in the video where we have to bear in mind that this is an old pickup truck with 150,000 miles on it, and we can't judge it like it's just come out of the factory. But in any case, regarding playability, one of the biggest foibles of this instrument and its current state of wear is that it does not mate very well with larger or deeper mouthpieces. This results in flat upper harmonics. Those harmonics don't have the greatest slots. They don't really like to sit conveniently anywhere and the tone up there doesn't have a whole lot of vibrance, as you'll hear. This antique Giardinelli B10, which I believe was designed for Myron Bloom, is about the largest mouthpiece, I would say, in terms of total cup volume that works well with this horn. It's a very, very deep cup, but it's also coupled with what I would consider a fairly small internal diameter, and so it does fine on the horn, but there were certain mouthpieces of mine that I personally like to play on, such as a Shulky 32 or my US fitting Dennis Wick 4N, which definitely did not fit this shank here that really just didn't perform optimally on this horn, and that's troublesome. One of the stronger aspects of this horn, though, in terms of tuning and whatnot, is the fact that the F slide was purposely a little bit short when Ed Crusby designed it, and I think it wins out against the Con 8D in this respect, because my Con 8D's F slide has to be all the way in, and the F side is still flatter than the B flat slide, so this one actually allows for a little bit more maneuverability, assuming you can get the slide in and out. And by the way, the reason this is an issue in the first place is because neither the Crusby nor the Con 8D have B flat independent tuning. This tuning slide is for the whole horn, so this lowers notes both on and off the trigger, whereas this is only the F side, be it on or off the trigger, it depends on your configuration. In typical Crusby wrap style, this horn is very husky, tastefully so, in the lower register and it has a lot of presence to the sound. It's wide open all the way down to pedal C and beyond. I think I ended on a pedal B in the clip to come. And it's best on large and deep mouthpieces, but as we discussed, it's not terribly sustainable in other registers of the horn. Overall, the B-flat and F-sides of this horn are fairly even, each has their own benefits and drawbacks, but neither terribly more so than the other. 
In the lower register, the B-flat side I think wins out a little bit for clarity. So even if I'm playing American horn, F, B-flat, I might do a little bit of trigger pressing in the lower register. Whereas in the middle register, I think the F side wins out. So if I, even if I'm playing European horn, B flat F, I might press the trigger for some of the stuff just barely below the staff or approaching the bottom of it. What I found really interesting about this horn is that for a crossbow wrap, it is on the brighter side for sure. It's a lot brighter than my Con 8D, which is ironic because the Con 8D is all nickel, which is actually supposed to kind of harshen the sound a little bit and the brass would actually be a rather mellower option but this thing is still a fair bit brighter than the 8D. The trouble is it doesn't project terribly well due to its current condition, and so it's tough to kind of step on the gas with this horn and kind of make the sound light up in true Hollywood fashion, the way you've heard Con 8Ds do in the 1970s and 1980s. But to that end, I think it makes a good solo horn in smaller orchestra settings for things like classical literature or Baroque literature, especially when you've got it set up in B flat F. It's tough when you've got a truck with 150,000 miles on it to make it drive as smoothly as it did out of the factory, but when you do kind of find the center or the core of the sound, it is really, really pleasant. Even if it's on the brighter side, it's a soft and delicate sound if you try, and it does take some fidgeting with, but I really enjoy playing on it once I do find the center. In the end, although this horn isn't exactly the perfect fit for me and I have no way of telling if a new one would be, this is a really amazing time capsule. It's a real piece of brass history. And it is incredible to be able to hold in my hands the horn that inspired my favorite horn of all time thus far, the Con 8D. It's really been an awesome experience getting to know this horn and do this video. I'd like to thank Vern Wyndham not only for letting me borrow the horn and do the video, but for being such a force for good in the community and inspiring so many people, myself included, in their own music making. If you enjoyed watching as much as I enjoyed putting this video together, check to make sure that you're actually subscribed to the Samuel Plays Brass channel. A lot of my viewers watch my videos all the time and actually don't realize that they're not subscribed. You can check out this chart here. Most of my viewers happen to not be subscribed. So hey, if that's you, no pressure or anything, but subscribing is a small gesture with a huge impact on the channel and we'll keep you caught up to date with more time capsule episodes like this if that's what you want to see. This has been Sam of Samuel Plays Brass reviewing the incredible 1969 Ed Crusby double French horn and until next time we'll see you on the flip side. Thanks for watching everybody. If you want to support the creation of bigger and better content on the Samuel Plays Brass channel, have your name featured right here and a whole host of other perks and benefits, then please consider pledging your support at patreon.com slash samuelplaysbrass. For now, you can find more videos in the end screen cards to my left.